<laughs> My sermon passage is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 10. The Apostle Paul writes, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up in paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I wish to boast, I shall not be a fool, for I shall be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. And to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I besought the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. <clears throat> Now, interesting that the Apostle Paul's vision of being hoisted to paradise, told in the third person, is a lectionary reading today, after I mentioned it last week. I don't read ahead in the lectionary, so it was a surprise. We must need to think about it some more. God is at work. You know, God guided the people who put together the revised common lectionary, I believe, although they weren't perfect. They were like us, faithful, but faulty. And I believe that God is at work in faithful preaching, even if a given sermon is faulty. This one could be. We'll see. <laughs> but we are in good hands. Last time I brought up just this part of today's passage. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body. I don't know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up in a paradise, whether in the body or out of the body. I do not know. God knows. And my point was to show that Paul apparently had no firm concept of the human soul, eternal or otherwise. Jesus saves people, not just souls. Paul preached the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of those dead who had trusted in Christ. He preached the resurrection of the entire dead saved self from the grave. Not the resurrection of a saved soul and not the raising of a dead body to reunite with an eternal soul. And I suggested last week that many in the church throughout history have been hell-bent, if you will, on saving souls or just demanding loyalty to the church while either ignoring the physical needs of bodies or worse, abusing or enslaving them. And hell-bent is exactly the right word. It means stubbornly and often recklessly determined. And Collins English Dictionary adds helpfully, if you say that someone is hell-bent on doing something, you are emphasizing that they're determined to do it even if this causes problems or difficulties for other people. And doesn't that sound like the church at its worst? From the Spanish requerimiento or requirement to Christian slave owners, quote, allowing slaves to worship God, to the mission of some to save gay souls but only to convert their gay minds and bodies to straightness. I do not mean to beat up on the church, but sometimes I can't help it, especially the church in history. And too much of the church now as history unfolds around us. That's what got me back to church 15 years ago. I couldn't complain about something I wasn't a part of. So I came back. Sorry. <laughs> I want to read you part of the Spanish requirement in English because you've probably never heard it. It's pretty long, but I'm just going to read part. They say that conquistadors read it to natives knowing and not caring that they couldn't understand. Actually, they didn't even offer salvation. They just announced that the church was present and they had better bow down. No grace, none, just a threat. After a 
Rome and Pope Centric Summary of Creation and the Gospel, they said, Wherefore, as best we can, we ask and require you to acknowledge the church as the ruler and superior of the whole world, and the high priest called Pope, and in his name the king and queen, in his place as superiors and lords and kings. If you do so, you will do well, and we in their name shall receive you in all love and charity, and shall leave you your wives and your children and your lands free without servitude that you may do with them and with yourselves freely that which you like and think best. And they shall not compel you to turn Christian, unless you yourselves, when informed of the truth, should wish to be converted to our holy Catholic faith. But if you do not do this, and maliciously make delay in it, I certify to you that with the help of God we shall powerfully enter into your country and shall make war against you in all ways and manners that we can and shall subject you to the yoke and obedience of the church and of their highnesses. We shall take you and your wives and your children and shall make slaves of them, and as such shall sell and dispose of them as their highnesses may command. And we shall take away your goods and shall do all the mischief and damage that we can as to vassals who do not obey and refuse to receive their Lord and resist and contradict him. And we protest that the debts and losses which shall accrue from this are your fault and not that of their highnesses or ours. Wow. Talk about hell, dude. Not all to get to the gold, but first to get to the bodies to enslave, to mine the gold, and to work on the plantations. If they got their souls saved, Not everybody in the Spanish church was so demonic. Not all church leaders were so full of themselves and so willing to cause problems or difficulties for people. Bartolome de las Casas, Spanish priest, bishop, and reformer, lived a generation after Columbus and famously condemned what Columbus had done and the evil results. So as awful as the church was, there's a conscience there. In our passage today, Paul is dealing with powerful church leaders who were full of themselves, similarly, and he coined a term for them, super apostles. Super apostles. And he probably meant it sarcastically. Well, aren't they super apostles? Look at them driving their Porsches, flying around in their private jets, raking in the bucks, preaching prosperity, as if that was the gospel. No way. I mean, my nuts are mixed up. That's TV and internet preachers. That's another class of super apostles, though. Just like the Spanish church held them on promoting themselves, supposedly in the name of Christ, causing problems and difficulties for other people. But that is what the super apostles, vexing Paul in Corinth, apparently turning some of the Corinthians against Paul, that's what they were doing. They were promoting themselves, supposedly in the name of Christ, causing problems and difficulties for other people. They were lording themselves over Paul, apparently boasting about their incredible visions and revelations. And they were looking down on Paul for being a tent maker, for working to support himself so he wasn't a burden on the Christians in Corinth. Apparently, the super apostles were doing more than just having the church support their ministry. They may have been getting rich off it. Whether the Corinthians were in on it and loved the flashy preachers, or they were duped, Paul's pastoral relationship with them and his pastoral authority in Christ was at stake. Oh, you want to get into a bragging contest, Paul says. Allow me. And he boasted, but shrewdly, wisely as a serpent. He bragged about how humble he was. <laughs> he bragged about his humility. It's clever rhetoric. He seems to have hoped that mimicking the super apostles and their self-righteous boasting and self-promotion would cause them to be seen and mocked as the frauds that he said they were. By boasting dramatically, if not comically, of his own demonstrated humility and his humble means, their hypocrisy would stand out. Some people think that's why Paul told his vision story of being taken up to paradise in the third person. He wanted it known that he could out-vision. He could out-vision and out-revelation. The 
best of the super apostles. But he also wanted to remind people that he wasn't a braggart like they were. Because it wasn't about him or bragging rights or the size of the church or its budget or any preacher. And it sure wasn't about personal apostle power, especially not personal super apostle power. <laughs> I say that. Personal super apostle power. And it wasn't later about institutional power or even raw military power like that wielded by the Spanish church. For Paul, it was all about the power of Christ. Oh, Paul said he could boast if he wanted to. And if he had plenty to brag about, could have gone to his head. In fact, Paul said he was such a visionary and so tuned in to direct revelation from God that God left him stuck with a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. Some chronic health issue or some other problem. It was a reminder for Paul and for us that no matter what, no matter what, even in pain and humility, God is in control. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for me, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Scholars speculate as to what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Epilepsy, hysteria, depression, migraines, eye problems, leprosy, malaria, maybe stuttering. Truth be told, we do not have a clue, quote, end quote, according to J. Paul Sampley, a United Methodist professor. And the professor should get props for scholarly humil humility. Truth be told, we do not have a clue. Humility is what Paul is stressing here. <coughs> humility. Get yourself out of the way so God can work even through our weaknesses as individuals, as a congregation, and as the church. I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses and the power of Christ may rest upon me, Paul. For the sake of Christ, then, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. People are leaving the weak church as a whole because of its historic sins and its present hypocrisies. It is a moral weakness and an institutional calamity. The fact that people, though, are still finding the Lord and still coming into the weak church is a miracle. Despite so much wrong with the church, from the spiritually weak Corinthians in the first century, to the morally weak, power-hungry Spanish church in the 16th century, to the institutionally weak church of today. It's a miracle. It's a God thing. It's enough. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So, as we come to the Lord's table, let us come with a spirit of humility and penitence. Please turn to number 74. In the African American Heritage Hymn. And let's recite a litany of the Holy Communion. Number 74. with a spirit of humility and penitence. Compassionate God, have mercy on us and pray. Let us examine ourselves, our thoughts, our actions, our motives, and our attitudes toward others. Oh, loving God, have mercy and forgive us our shortcomings. Help us to remember our responsibility to our families and our neighbors, our stewardship to you, and the work you have given to our hands. O oh, living God, we stand in need of your grace, strength, and mercy. As we eat the bread which represents your body, which is the true and living bread, open our eyes to recognize the intimacy that you yearn to share with us. O oh, loving God, teach us to love you above all else. As we drink the cup which represents Christ's blood shed for us, we thank you for the new covenant. Love ye one another which is written on our hearts. Let us rejoice because our names are written in heaven. Tender, Tender Father and Mother, may your great, great sacrifice, sacrifice of redeeming love renew us for loving service and sacrifice for others. 
May this Lord's Supper energize every era, every area of our lives and enable us to transcend our circumstances, our inadequacies, and our enemies. God, God who sees us, us touch and, and empower, empower us so that our lives will be renewed. We praise you, O God, who made us your own people through the death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Abide in us, Savior, and redeem. 